five more. Hello, dear listeners, and welcome back to another episode of the Identity Podcast on the Podmoth Media Network, your bi-weekly foray into the weird, wonky, and sometimes downright spooky. If you'll permit me, I'd like to take a moment to thank you all for your messages of condolence and your unwavering support over the last few weeks. It was truly appreciated, and it made me realize even more how much my listeners and my podcast community really mean to me. This week, I present you with a Victorian ghost story. Well, part one of it, at least. It's a little longer, so the next episode will feature the tale's conclusion. Some of these stories are so wonderful, and yet they don't nearly get the readers an appreciation that they deserve. The Victorians were keen on ghost stories. We have that in common. So settle in next to the fire, pull the blankets up to your chin, and try to ignore the shadows lingering at the edge of the firelight. I'm sure they're all conjured by your imagination. This story and books within this collection are public domain, free to use and reuse, and are provided by the Library of Congress. And now, on with the show. The Phantom Rickshaw by Rudyard Kipling May no ill dreams disturb my rest, nor powers of darkness me molest. Evening Hymn One of the few advantages that India has over England is a certain great knowability. After five years' service, a man is directly or indirectly acquainted with two or three hundred civilians in his province, all of the messes of ten or twelve regiments and batteries, and some 1,500 other people of the non-official casts. In ten years, his knowledge should be doubled, and at the end of twenty, he knows, or knows something about, almost every Englishman in the empire, and may travel anywhere and everywhere without paying hotel bills. Globetrotters who expect entertainment as a right have, even within my memory, blunted this open-heartedness. But nonetheless, today if you belong to the inner circle, and are neither a bear nor a black sheep, all houses are open to you, and our small world is very kind and helpful. Ricket of Camartha stayed with Polder of Comanon some fifteen years ago. He meant to stay two nights only, but was knocked down by rheumatic fever, and for six weeks disorganized Polder's establishment, stopped Polder's work, and nearly died in Polder's bedroom. Polder behaves as though he had been placed under eternal obligation by Rickett, and yearly sends the little Ricketts a box of presents and toys. It is the same everywhere. The men who do not take the trouble to conceal from you their opinion that you are an incompetent ass, and the women who blacken your character and misunderstand your wife's amusements, will work themselves to the bone in your behalf if you fall sick or into serious trouble. Heatherley, the doctor, kept in addition to his regular practice a hospital on his private account an arrangement of loose boxes for incurables, his friends called it, but it was really a sort of fitting-up shed for craft that had been damaged by the stress of weather. The weather in India is often sultry, and since the tale of bricks is a fixed quantity, 
and the only library allowed is permission to work overtime and get no thanks, men occasionally break down and become as mixed as the metaphors in this sentence. Heatherley is the nicest doctor that ever was, and his invariable prescription to all his patients is lie low, go slow, and keep cool. He says that more men are killed by overwork than the importance of this world justifies. He maintains that overwork slew Panse, who died under his hands about three years ago. He has, of course, the right to speak authoritatively, and he laughs at my theory that there was a crack in Panse's head, and a little bit of the dark world came through and pressed him to death. Panze went off the handle, says Heatherley. After the stimulus of long leave at home, he may or he may not have behaved like a blackguard to Mrs. Keith Wessington. My notion is that the work of Katabundi settlement ran him off his legs, and that he took to brooding and making much of an ordinary P&O flirtation. He certainly was engaged to Miss Mannering, and she certainly broke off that engagement. Then he took to a feverish chill, and all that nonsense about ghosts developed itself. Overwork started his illness, kept it alight, and killed him, poor devil. Write him off to the system. One man to do the work of two and a half men. I do not believe this. I used to sit up with Panzai sometimes when Heatherly was called out to visit patients, and I happened to be within claim. The man would make me most unhappy by describing in a low, even voice the procession of men, women, children, and devils that was always passing at the bottom of his bed. He had a sick man's command of language. When he recovered, I suggested that he should write out the whole affair from beginning to end, knowing that ink might assist him to ease his mind. When little boys have learned a new bad word, they are never happy until they have chalked it up on a door. And this also is literature. He was in high fever while he was writing and the Blood and Thunder magazine style he adopted did not calm him. Two months afterwards, he was reported fit for duty, but in spite of the fact that he was urgently needed to help the undermanned commission stagger through a deficit, he preferred to die, vowing at the last that he was hag-ridden. I secured his manuscript before he died, and this is the version of the affair, dated 1885. My doctor tells me that I need rest and change of air. It is not improbable that I shall get both ere long, rest that neither the red-coated orderly or the midday gun can break, and change of air far beyond which any homeward-bound steamer can give me. In the meantime, I am resolved to stay where I am, and in flat defiance of my doctor's orders, to take all the world into my confidence. You shall learn for yourselves the precise nature of my malady, and shall, too, judge for yourselves whether any man born of woman on this weary earth was ever so tormented as I. Speaking now as a condemned criminal might, ere the drop bolts are drawn, my story, wild and hideously improbable as it may appear, demands at least attention. That it will ever receive credence, I utterly disbelieve. Two months ago, I should have scouted as mad or drunk the man who had dared tell me the like. Two months ago, I was the happiest man in India. Today, from Peshawar to the sea, there is no one more wretched my doctor and I are the only two who know this. His explanation is that my brain, digestion, and eyesight are all slightly affected, giving rise to my frequent and persistent delusions. Delusions, indeed. I call him a fool, but he attends me still with the same unwearied smile, the same bland professional manner, the same neatly trimmed red whiskers, till I begin to suspect 
that I am an ungrateful, evil-tempered invalid. But you shall judge for yourselves. Three years ago, it was my fortune, my great misfortune, to sail from Gravesend to Bombay on return from long leave with one Agnes Keith Wessington, wife to an officer on the Bombay side. It does not in the least concern you to know what manner of woman she was. Be content with the knowledge that, ere the voyage had ended, both she and I were desperately and unreasoningly in love with one another. Heaven knows I can make an admission now, without one particle of vanity. In matters of this sort, there is always one who gives and another who accepts. From the first day of our ill-omened attachment, I was conscious that Agnes's presence was stronger and more dominant, if I may use the expression, a purer sentiment than mine. Whether she recognized the fact then, I do not know. Afterwards, it was bitterly plain to the both of us. Arrived at Bombay in the spring of the year, we went our respective ways, to meet no more for the next three or four months, when my leave and her love took us both to Simla. There we spent the season together, and there my fire of straw burnt itself out to a pitiful end within the closing year. I attempt no excuse, I make no apology, Miss Wessington had given up much for my sake, and was prepared to give up all. From my own lips in August 1882, she learnt that I was sick of her presence, tired of her company, and weary of the sound of her voice. Ninety-nine out of a hundred women would have wearied of me as I wearied of them. Seventy-five of that number would have promptly avenged themselves by active and obtrusive flirtation with other men. Mrs. Wessington was the hundredth. On her neither my openly expressed aversion, nor the cutting brutalities with which I garnished our interviews, had the least effect. Jack, darling, was her one eternal cuckoo cry. I'm sure it's all a mistake, a hideous mistake, and we'll be good friends again some day. Please forgive me, Jack, dear. I was the offender, and I knew it. The knowledge transformed my pity into passive endurance, and eventually into blind hate. The same instinct, I suppose, which prompts a man to savagely stamp on a spider he has but half killed. And with this hate in my bosom, the season of 1882 came to an end. Next year, we met again at Simla. She with her monotonous face and timid attempts at reconciliation, and I with loathing of her in every fiber of my frame. Several times I could not avoid meeting her alone, and on each occasion her words were identically the same. Still the unreasoning wail that it was all a mistake, and still the hope of eventually making friends. I might have seen, had I cared to look, that that hope was only keeping her alive. She grew more wan and thin, month by month. You will agree with me, at least, that such conduct would have driven anyone to despair. It was uncalled for, childish, unwomanly. I maintain that she was much to blame, and again, sometimes, in the black, fever-stricken night watches, I have begun to think that I might have been a little kinder to her. But that really is a delusion. I could not have continued pretending to love her when I didn't, could I? It would have been unfair to us both. Last year we met again, on the same terms as before. The same weary appeals, the same curt answers from my lips. At least I would make her see how wholly wrong and hopeless her attempts were at resuming the old relationship. As the season wore on, we fell apart. That is to say, she found it difficult to meet me, for I had other more absorbing interests to attend to. When I think it over quietly in my sick room, the season of 1884 seems 
a confused nightmare, wherein light and shade were fantastically intermingled. My courtship of little Kitty Mannering, my hopes, doubts, and fears, our long rides together, my trembling avowal of attachment, her reply, and now and again the vision of a white face flitting by in the rickshaw with black and white liveries I once watched for so earnestly. The wave of Mrs. Wessington's gloved hand, and when she met me alone, which was but seldom, the irksome monotony of her appeal. I loved Kitty Mannering, honestly, heartily loved her, and with my love for her grew my hatred for Agnes. In August, Kitty and I were engaged. The next day I met those accursed magpie Jahampanis in the back of Jekko, and moved by some passing sentiment of pity, stopped by to tell Mrs. Wessington everything. She knew it already. So I hear you're engaged, Jack, dear. Then, without a pause, I'm sure it's a mistake, a hideous mistake. We shall be good friends some day, Jack, as we ever were. My answer might have made a man wince. I cut the dying woman before me like the blow of a whip. Please forgive me, Jack. I didn't mean to make you angry, but it's true. It's true. And Mrs. Wessington broke down completely. I turned away and left her to finish her journey in peace, feeling, but only for a moment or two, that I had been an unutterably mean hound. I looked back and saw that she turned her rickshaw with the idea, I suppose, of overtaking me. The scene and its surroundings were photographed on my memory. The rain-swept sky, we were at the end of wet weather, the sodden, dingy pines, the muddy road, and the black powder-riven cliffs formed a gloomy background against which was black and white liveries of the Jehovenes, the yellow-paneled rickshaw, and Mrs. Wessington's down-bowed golden head stood out clearly. She was holding her handkerchief in her left hand, and was leaning back, exhausted against the rickshaw cushions. I turned my horse up the bypath near the San Gialli Reservoir, and literally ran away. Once I fancied the faint call of, Jack! This may have been imagination. I never stopped to verify it. Ten minutes later, I came across Kitty on horseback, and in the delight of a long ride with her, forgot all about the interview. A week later, Mrs. Wessington died, and the inexpressible burden of her existence was removed from my life. I went plains word perfectly happy. Before three months were over, I had forgotten all about her, except that, at times of discovery, some of her old letters reminded me unpleasantly of our bygone relationship. By January, I had disinterred what was left of our correspondence from among my scattered belongings, and had burnt it. At the beginning of April of this year, 1885, I was in Simla, semi-deserted Simla, once more, and was deep in lovers' talks and walks with Kitty. It was decided that we should be married the end of June. You will understand, therefore, that, loving Kitty as I did, I'm not saying too much when I pronounce myself to have been, at the time, the happiest man in India. Fourteen delightful days passed before I noticed their flight. Then, aroused to the sense of what was proper among mortals, circumstances we were, I pointed out to Kitty that an engagement ring was the outward and visible sign of her dignity as an engaged girl, and that she must forthwith come to Hamilton's to be measured for one. Up to that moment, I give you my word, we had completely forgotten so trivial a matter. To Hamilton's we accordingly went on the 15th of April, 1885. Remember that, whatever my doctor may say to the contrary, I was then in perfect health, enjoying a well-balanced mind and an absolutely tranquil spirit. 
Kitty and I entered Hamilton's shop together, and there, regardless of the order of affairs, I measured Kitty's finger for the ring in the presence of the amused assistant. The ring was a sapphire with two diamonds. We then rode out down the slope that leads to the Comerbear Bridge and Polybe's shop. While my whaler was cautiously feeling its way over the loose shale, and Kitty was laughing and chattering at my side, while all Simla, that is to say as much of it as had then come from the plains, was grouped round the reading room and Polidi's veranda. I was aware of someone, apparently at a vast distance, was calling me by my Christian name. It struck me that I had never heard that voice before, but when and where I could not at once determine. In the short space it took to cover the road between the path from Hamilton's shop and the first plank of the Common Bear Bridge, I had thought over half a dozen people who might have committed such a solecism, and had eventually decided that it must have been some ringing in my ears. Immediately opposite Polybe's shop, my eye was arrested by the sight of four Jehampanies in black and white livery, pulling a yellow-paneled, cheap, bizarre rickshaw. In a moment, my mind flew back to the previous season, and Mrs. Wessington in a sense of irritation and disgust. Was it not enough that the woman was dead and done with, without her black and white servitors reappearing to spoil the day's happiness? Whoever employed them now, I thought, I would call upon and ask for a personal favor to change her Jehampanes livery. I would hire the men myself, and if necessary, buy their coats from off their backs. It's impossible to say here what a flood of undesirable memories their presence evoked. Kitty, I cried, there are poor Miss Wessington's Jehampanes turned up again. I wonder who has them now. Kitty had known Mrs. Wessington slightly last season, and had always been interested in the sickly woman. What? Where? she asked. I can't see them anywhere. Even as she spoke, her horse, swerving from a laden mule, threw himself directly in front of the advancing rickshaw. I had scarcely time to utter a word of warning when in my unutterable horror, horse and rider passed through men and carriage as if they had been thin air. "'What's the matter?' cried Kitty. "'What made you call out so foolishly, Jack? "'If I am engaged, I don't want all creation to know about it. "'There was lots of space between the mule and the veranda, "'and if you think I can't ride, there!' "'Whereupon willful Kitty set off her dainty little head in the air, at a hand gallop in the direction of the bandstand, fully expecting, as she herself afterwards told me, that I should follow her. What was the matter? Nothing indeed. Either that I was mad or drunk, or that Simla was haunted with devils. I ranged in my impatient cob and turned round. The rickshaw had turned too, and now stood immediately facing me, near the left railing of the Common Bear Bridge. Jack! Jack, darling! There was no mistake about the words this time. They rang through my brain as if they'd been shouted in my ear. It's some hideous mistake, I'm sure. Please forgive me, Jack, and let's be friends again. The rickshaw hood had fallen back, and inside, as I hoped the daily pray for death, I dread by night, sat Mrs. Keith Wessington, handkerchief in hand, and golden head bowed to her breast. How long I stared motionless, I do not know. Finally, I was aroused by my groom, taking the whaler's bridle, and asked whether I was ill. I tumbled off my horse and dashed, half fainting, into Polides for a glass of cherry brandy. There, two or three couples were gathered round coffee tables discussing the gossip of the day. Their trivialities were more comforting to me than just the consolations of religion could have been. I plunged into the midst of conversation at once, chatted, laughed, and jested with a face when I caught a glimpse of it in a mirror, as white and drawn as that of a corpse. 
Three or four men noticed my condition, and evidently setting it down to the results of over many pegs, charitably endeavored to draw me apart from the rest of the loungers. But I refused to be led away. I wanted company of my kind, as a child rushes into the midst of a dinner party after a fright in the dark. I must have talked about it for ten minutes or so, though it seemed an eternity to me, when I heard Kitty's voice outside inquiring for me. In another minute she had entered the shop, prepared to roundly upbraid me for failing so signally in my duties. Something in my face stopped her. "'Why, Jack,' she cried, "'what have you been doing? What has happened? Are you ill?' Thus driven into a direct lie, I said that the sun had been a little too much for me. It was upon five o'clock of a cloudy April afternoon, and the sun had been hidden all day. I saw my mistake as soon as the words were out of my mouth, attempted to recover it, blundered hopelessly, and followed Kitty in a regal rage out of doors amid the smiles of my acquaintances. I made some excuse, I have forgotten what, on the score of my feeling faint, and cantered away to my hotel, leaving Kitty to finish the ride herself. In my room I sat down and tried to calmly reason out the matter. Here I was, Theobald Jack Panze, a well-educated Bengal civilian, in the year of grace 1885, presumably sane, certainly healthy, driven in terror from my sweetheart's side by the apparition of a woman who had been dead and buried eight months ago. These were facts that I could not blink. Nothing was further from my thought than any memory of Mrs. Wessington, when Kitty and I had left Hamilton's shop. Nothing was more utterly commonplace than the stretch of wall opposite Polides. It was broad daylight, the road was full of people, and yet here, look you, in defiance of every law of probability, in direct outrage of nature's ordinance, there had appeared to me a face from the grave. Kitty's Arab had gone through the rickshaw, so that my first hope was some woman marvelously, like Mrs. Wessington, had hired the carriage and the coolies with their old livery lost. Again and again I went round the treadmill of thought, and again and again I gave up baffled in despair. The voice was as inexplicable as the apparition. I had originally some wild notion of confiding it all to Kitty, of begging her to marry me at once, and in her arms defying the ghostly occupant of the rickshaw. After all, I argued, the presence of the rickshaw in itself is enough to prove the existence of a spectral illusion. One may see ghosts of men and women, but surely never of coolies and carriages. The whole thing is absurd. Fancy the ghost of a hillman. Next morning, I sent a penchant note to Kitty, imploring her to overlook my strange conduct of the previous afternoon. My divinity was still very wroth, and a personal apology was necessary. I explained, with a fluency born of night-long pondering over a falsehood, that I had been attacked with a sudden palpitation of the heart, the result of indigestion. This eminently practical solution had its effect, and Kitty and I rode out that afternoon with the shadow of my first lie dividing us. Nothing would please her save a canter around Jacko. With my nerves still unstrung from the previous night, I feebly protested against the notion, suggesting Observatory Hill, Duteau, the Boiler Grunge Road, anything rather than Jacko Round. Kitty was angry and a little hurt, so I yielded from fear of provoking further misunderstanding, and we set out together towards Chota Simla. We walked a greater part of the way, and according to our custom, cantered from a mile or so below the convent to the stretch of level road by Sanjali Reservoir. The wretched horses appeared to fly, and my heart beat quicker and quicker as we neared the crest of the ascent. My mind had been full of Mrs. Wessington, all afternoon, and every inch of the Jacko Road bore witness 
to our old-time walks and talks. The boulders were full of it. The pines sang aloud overhead. The rain-fed torrents giggled and chuckled unseen over the shameful story, and the wind in my ears chanted the inequity aloud. As a fitting climax, in the middle of the level men called the Lady's Mile, the horror was awaiting me. No other rickshaw was in sight, only the four black and white Jehampanies, the yellow paneled carriage, and the golden head of the woman within, all apparently just as I'd left them eight months and one fortnight ago. For an instant, I fancied that Kitty must see what I saw. We were so marvelously sympathetic in all things. Her next words undeceived me. Not a soul in sight. Come along, Jack, I'll race you to the reservoir buildings. Her wiry little Arab was off, like a bird, my whaler following close behind, and in this order we dashed under the cliffs. Half a minute brought us within fifty yards of the rickshaw. I pulled my whaler and fell back a little. The rickshaw was directly in the middle of the road, and once more the Arab passed through it, my, my horse following. Jack, Jack dear, please forgive me, rang with a wail in my ears, and after an interval, it's all a mistake, a hideous mistake. I spurred my horse like a man possessed. When I turned my head at the reservoir works, the black and white liveries were still waiting, patiently waiting, under the gray hillside, and the wind brought me mocking echo of the words I had just heard. Kitty bantered me a good deal on my silence throughout the remainder of the ride. I had been talking, up until then, wildly and at random. To save my life, I could not speak afterwards naturally, and from San Jolly to the church, wisely held my tongue. We've reached the end of Part 1, dear listener. Tune in next time for Part 2 of The Phantom Rickshaw by Rudyard Kipling. Until then, stay spooky. The Identity Podcast is brought to you by host Janine Mercer, and the music was created using GarageBand. Find The Odd Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Identity Pod, and on Facebook as The Identity Podcast. A transcript of this episode will be available at theidentitypodcast.wordpress.com. Got a paranormal experience to share? Send those along to theidentitypodcast at gmail.com. If you liked what you heard, please take a moment to mash that subscribe button and leave me a five-star review. Don't forget to tell your friends, family, and coworkers about this podcast. Every little bit helps. Located on the edges of your radio static, you've stumbled upon the lost signal, your podcast destination for tales of horror and the macabre, brought to life with voice acting and sound effects. New episodes are released every two weeks on Monday on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Join us, won't you?